Yeah. Okay, so, uh, fishing in the age of Skynet. So, that's what's kind of said there. Hi, um, I'm Mark. Um, previously, some of you might recognize me from a few of the modules I've helped out with. Um, but for those that don't, I previously went through the ethical hacking degree, as I'm sure many of you currently are. Um, but now, however, I'm a PhD student focusing on machine learning and usable security, and um, specifically applying natural language processing to kind of, uh, try and counter fraud and deception on online dating sites trying to understand how the person you're speaking with is who they say they really are, and then how do you warn users when that isn't the case. But we'll have a chance to come back to that. Now, you've had talks before on things like cryptography or reverse engineering or pen testing, but I want to take a slightly different approach. That being that you probably aren't concerned enough about the impact that AI is going to have on your job, either currently or in the future, and for better or worse. And I don't mean this in the kind of hand-wavy Skynet is here kind of way, but rather that, like a lot of things, AI is going to slowly creep its way into a whole bunch of different goals in a way that I don't think a lot of us are really prepared for. But of course, just to, before we jump in, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, just do a quick refresh on what artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, all that good stuff actually is. And more importantly, is not. So in the broadest sense, when we say AI, we're talking about um, teaching computers how to sort of think for themselves how to take an input from the environment and then act upon that. So things like machine learning, meanwhile, is understood as applying that understanding to actual sort of practical tasks. So things like analyzing conversations or things like computer vision, having the computer look at its environment and respond to different objects around it. Um, for the purposes of this talk, however, I'll largely be using the two interchangeably to kind of mean a computer that could learn to do things. Um, now, I might be biased, but I think machine learning is one of the most exciting fields you can be working in just now. As far as I can tell, there's no one else with the many breakthroughs happening as quickly as there is here. Um, however, I think it's important to be upfront and say that um, machine learning and AI often isn't like what it's shown in the news as. Okay? It's important to be clear here that AI is not some kind of you know, radical new technology that gives computers divine knowledge to solve all our problems. You know, it isn't a sort of you know, fix-all for every issue we might have. Um, and it's important to say as well, it doesn't render humans obsolete and it isn't sort of the next step in human evolution. Okay? As much as it's fun to get caught up in the hype, it's really important to stress that you know there is a big jump between a computer learning to play Pong and a Terminator crushing the human skull. There is a big leap. <laughs> in fact, when we say uh, we're talking about AI, um, a better example is that in an extremely simplified way, we're talking about teaching computers very, very nuanced forms of pattern recognition. Well, generally, we're talking about building systems that can look at past examples of behavior, learn from that, and then sort of build and improve themselves over time. So, for instance, if you want to build a system for mapping roads, you would give it millions of examples of annotated streets, or for recognizing numbers in someone's handwriting, give it millions of variations in the same number, or for potentially building a self-driving car, give it millions and millions of hours of annotated video with different things like pedestrians, traffic lights, and such, so that it can understand these different obstacles and the items. Um, or to put that in a more cyber security context, if you want to detect if there's going to be a, a breach in your network, give it millions of examples of packets of good and bad traffic. Or for detecting potentially malicious code, give it millions of examples of good and bad examples of code. Now, that sounds like quite a simple process. In theory, we, give, you know, we tell the computer what we want, what we don't want, and in theory it should figure out the rest for us. But in practice, that's quite an often difficult and challenging process that doesn't always go the way we expect. In fact, for a long time, there were certain tasks that it was thought AI could just never accomplish. Things that were you know, too, too complex or too abstract or somehow too human for an AI to learn. And one popular example was chess. Back in the 1950s, the idea was that chess had just too many moves, too many different pieces and too many combinations that it would be far too complicated for an AI to beat a human at chess. And then in 1996, a system called Deep Blue defeated the World Grandmaster. And so, going back to the drawing board, what about Go? Go is another board game and largely played in Asia with hundreds more pieces and billions of potential positions. It's a game so complicated, in fact, that even the top human players sometimes struggle to keep track of what happened in a given game. And then in 2016, a system called AlphaGo defeated the world number one. And so, back to jump board again, what about R? If AI has been shown to be really good at these sort of strict rules-based systems like we see in things like board games and such, then R must sit at the complete opposite end of the spectrum for that. R must be too abstract and too uniquely human that an AI could never produce its own R. And so you can probably guess where this is going. Last year, OpenAI, um, an AI research company, introduced DALI2, a system that lets users um, enter simple prompts and generate completely unique images. And then in the summer of that year, GitHub, the version control site, introduced Copilot for helping programmers write code by just describing the problems to be solved. And at the end of last year, Google announced Imagine. It lets users generate entire videos by just entering simple prompts. And so, if we take all these milestones and sort of put them together, there's a few interesting points that start to come forward. Because not only is each breakthrough more impressive than the last, but they're also starting to happen faster and faster. 
And what the past 20 or so years have shown us are that not only are a lot of the areas that were thought to be completely out of reach of AI actually not, but the speed with which they can actually sort of match and then overcome human ability isn't actually that long. And so if AI can edge its way into more, more and more fields, it can learn to write its own code, it can learn to play every board game, create its own art, edge its way into more and more different kind of roles and jobs. Why should cybersecurity be any different? And that's what I want to talk about today. The fact that a lot of the news surrounding AI tends to sort of fall into two camps. Either Skynet is here and it's game over, or the threat, any kind of serious threat from AI is always, no matter what, always 10 years away in the future. Rarely do we talk about what AI is actually doing right now and the kind of effects we're going to experience in the short term. And a lot of the discussion tends to be in the abstract as well. Either other people's jobs will become redundant because of AI, but your job, no matter what it is, will somehow always be safe. And cybersecurity might seem like one that falls into this kind of camp. You know, a lot of cybersecurity rules require this really sort of deep intimate knowledge of your systems to understand how they work and how to keep them secure. So, in fact, it could be argued even that um, a lot of security rules require that human element for that kind of inventive out of the box thinking and finding new ways to exploit or keep systems safe. So, when we say about an AI colliding with cybersecurity, the sort of thing that might come to mind is some sort of you know, turbocharged super hacker that can find holes in any defense. Um, and while we're not quite there yet, I can guarantee that every nation state is working very hard on it, though. Now, there's another area that um, AI could have a massive impact in, and one that we're starting to sort of dip our toes in with now. It might be the low-hanging fruit of cyber attacks, but of course, I'm talking about phishing. Phishing, phishing is the exact kind of thing that AI could have a real massive impact on, um, not just in the medium or short, medium or long term, but right now. Now, I want you to think of the last time that you, knowingly, got a phishing email. You know, usually it's something along the lines of, your account's been compromised, please visit passwordresetbank.ru to reset your password. Or there was an issue with your delivery, click this very legitimate bit.ly link to reschedule. Or something along the lines, there was an issue with your payslip, you know, view this very legitimate real PDF to help verify your details. Yeah, it kind of goes without saying that most phishing emails aren't great. In fact, most of the time, more often than not, we take a brief skim in the message, realize something isn't right, and send it straight to the bin. Or in even better cases, an automated system, which we'll come back to, skims message and sends it straight to the bin as soon as it lands in your inbox. And for obvious reasons, phishing attacks are one of, if not the most common form of cyber attack. Every day, billions of messages are sent out to millions of potential victims. It just isn't possible for an attacker to craft these kind of bespoke custom tailored messages that fit in seamlessly with your inbox. And for the scammer, a big bottleneck is crap is um, how many messages they can craft that vaguely fit to millions of different situations. So overall then, we can probably feel safe that for the most part, phishing is something that's taken care of. Either we can continue to remain vigilant, um, or let automated systems handle it for us. That's a relief, isn't it? Anyway, this is GPT-3. GPT-3 is the latest version of uh, OpenAI, the company I mentioned earlier, is the uh, latest large language model. Um, as much as I'd like to get into the details of how the systems work for the purpose of this talk, a large language model is a model with a really good understanding of language. And models like these can do things like translate between languages or pick up different entities and text. And they can also be used to generate content about whatever topic comes to mind. Um, absolutely whatever topic comes to mind. Things like a marketing copy for a pair of cement shoes, or a sonnet about spoiled milk, or a Hello World program that wipes your entire hard drive. Um, <laughs> absolutely anything, including very convincing phishing emails. Um, something that was demonstrated by uh, Lim, Tam and Hawk um, at DEF CON 29 just over a year ago. And what the uh, author showed was that GPT-3 can actually be integrated as part of the attack process. So while the, the human aspect of uh, going off and doing sort of general OSINT, like things like scraping LinkedIn and Twitter and such for information, GPT-3 GPT can actually be slotted into that part of that attack process. So in fact, creating convincing pitch emails is as simple as um, just sort of instructing the AI to write a general convincing um, email with some sort of general context, and like the name, target, um, name, role, and what kind of company they work for. In fact, the kind of scenarios that the AI was coming up with are quite varied as well. In some cases, um, the AI sent over things like headhunting emails, looking for the victim to join their company and have this you know, a malicious form attached. Others received emails pretending to be from HR or finance, looking for um, newer employees that might be looking for like a six-month review and asking for feedback from them to complete. And the emails were actually so convincing, in fact, that in some cases, victims were 20% more likely to click on a phishing email generated by GPT than by a human one. Um, it's worth stressing as well, this hasn't been done with any kind of you know, um, bespoke custom tailored model. This is the off-the-shelf um, GPT model that anyone in this room can get access to today, for free as well. And from their side, it's not entirely clear how, how easy this kind of attacks would be to detect. Many sort of standard uh, phishing filtering systems work based off of measuring how similar a new email is to known phishing emails. If the attack can now kind of generate an infinite number of variations, 
how easy is that to detect? Where would you even start? But of course, we all don't just communicate by email. Over the past years, many of us have turned to online conferencing. Well, not even the person you're hearing or um, seeing can actually be who they say they are. Deepfakes are becoming increasingly sophisticated and um, hard to detect. We use machine learning to superimpose someone's face on top of another and have them you know, look and say and do things that they never actually did. Um, they're also increasingly being used to synthesize voices as well, how people speak and say things they never actually did as well. But just a few years ago, deepfakes would have been pretty easy to detect. And typically clips people with sort of faces that seem to float in front of their head or these sort of followed by these strange static, wispy sounding voices. And um, this kind of thing was expensive as well, even on quite well specced hardware at the time. It could take days to produce even a short clip. But now deepfakes are convincing enough to be synthesized, you know, in real time and map just not um, your face and head, but also your entire body and voice in real time. And um, it's the kind of thing as well that can be used to now actually generate the rest of your head and body based on just a single image. It might be an extreme example, but last year, during the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, a video surfaced online that appeared to show um, President Zelensky surrendering to Russia. Of course, it wasn't real, it was a deep fake. Zelensky's head and, head and voice um, hijacked to make him say something he never did. But what about in a smaller context? Maybe like a colleague or something that you only speak to occasionally messages you to ask for help getting back into their account. And of course, we know what online conferencing is like. If you're on a jittery connection where audio, audio jumps out or like the sort of um, static and such, how easy is that to tell the difference between what's just a network error and what's actually a deep fake? Again, AI is being used on both sides um, to generate synthetic content whilst to detect it. Um, previously, detection was quite straightforward um, to the point of not even really needing an AI to help. Um, one of the best cases was if you look at the deep fakes in the bottom though, you'll see that when they sort of turn to the side, their face starts to sort of collapse into itself because the AI runs out of information about what the rest of your head looks like. But now, obviously, as things have progressed and enhanced, and it becomes harder and harder, harder and harder to detect these kind of things. And for a period, one of the best ways to detect deepfakes was to use edge detection. So measuring things like sort of features on the face and shadows and such, and then and calculating if they made sense in the context that they were, they were being shown. But again, these systems aren't perfect. And right now, in fact, sometimes fooling these systems is as easy as just sprinkling some sort of static and noise over videos to get a, a free pass, essentially. Still, deepfakes have got a lot of moving parts, and that means it can still get detected fairly easily. A face that doesn't properly line up or uh, lip and, lips and voices don't quite sync up in time. They're getting harder and harder to detect, but they aren't yet indistinguishable. And things like GP GPT-3 are good, but they're more meant as a kind of one and done tool. I need to generate one phishing email and then I'm finished. But of course, attackers aren't always going to work in this way. You might, have, you might have that kind of first initial contact to get the interest of your victim, but they're probably not going to hand over the credentials right there and then. But you do have a hook that you can build from. Similar to might manually writing phishing emails though, and keeping a dozen or so victims engaged can be quite a challenge for an attacker. You've got to keep track of who you've spoken to, what kind of access you have, what information they've given you already. That's quite a challenge to keep track of that and to manually have those conversations going back and forth. So overall then, it's quite good that the service is a kind of bottleneck to slow attackers. Anyway, this is a chat GPT, um, a spin-off of GPT-3 that's uh, tailored specifically for a conversation. Um, you enter a prompt and ChatGPT will do a pretty good job of having a realistic back and forth with you. Um, some of you might already be familiar with ChatGPT when it made the headlines last December. Um, it really kind of blew right out of the water for how popular and how capable it was. Um, ChatGPT would be the end of the academic essay because you could generate you know, an infinite number of essays about any topic to fit any word count. Um, authors would bear it with job because it could generate an infinite number of bestsellers. Um, Stack Overflow had to ban the usage of GPT models because people would feed in questions asked by users, feed it in the model, and then just paste a response from whatever it got. But ChatGPT was also when the rise of these models actually became personal, because as I said, I do work trying to detect fraud and deception on dating platforms. Well, within days of ChatGPT getting released, people used it to automate Tinder. Um, they created a bot that would swipe on every match, and then ChatGPT handled everything else, coming up with openings, interests, jokes, completely removing the human from the equation. It's funny and maybe a little bit sad, but I have absolutely no doubt that this approach would be used by attackers as well. Like, I'm trying to tackle romance fraud, where scammers impersonate your sort of true love in order to con victims out of thousands. A big bottleneck for attackers is how many conversations they can keep going at once, how many victims they can keep lured in and exploiting money from. ChatGPT basically gets rid of this. But don't worry though, because it gets worse. Because if we're bringing ChatGPT3 again from earlier, that can be used to generate entire, quite realistic profiles as well. In fact, making fake accounts as simple as given the prompt to create a comma separated tabular database of customer data from a dating app and then just specifying what kind of information we want. So things like first name, last name, sexual interest, gender and such. And in fact, if we look at the results from that, 
you can see that you don't actually have to specify a kind of list of um, names or cities or jobs to pick from because the model already has a good understanding of what those are and how they relate to each other. Pair that with a bunch of GPT, chat GPT instances and you've got a pretty good way of having a whole army of little um, machines for scamming users. I didn't start my PhD that long ago, but AI is moving so quickly in fact that there's now an entirely new threat that wasn't present when I started. Not just how do you detect human attackers, but then how do you also detect AI attackers? So what do we do now? There's always been this kind of back and forth between red team and blue team, and white hat and black hat, you know, good guys and bad guys. Just as one side finds a new area of exploitation, the other side patches up. But AI is going to radically disrupt this, and I don't think it's quite clear yet who has the upper hand. If tools like Metasploit and Armitage and such you might be familiar with is helping simplify and streamline that sort of exploitation step, then tools like um, ChatGPT and GPT-3 help simplify and lower the barrier to entry for exploiting the human aspect. Rather than spend hours crafting the perfect phishing email, you can just click generate um, and see what you get back. And if it isn't what you're after, just roll the dice again and generate a new one. If security gets suspicious and want to face to face to check things out, you need what, a single photo and about the length of audio the same as like a voicemail to look and sound the part. I mentioned as well the phishing email shown earlier that we generated using the default version of GPT-3. Well, the benefit of large language models like that is that they can be tailored for specific purposes. Because the model already has a really good understanding of language, like what words mean, how they relate to each other, what kind of order they appear in, it becomes possible to then extend that towards specific tasks. Usually, this takes the form of things like feeding in thousands of research abstracts in order to summarize uh, research papers, or measuring public opinion by feeding them millions of different comments about a topic, or inputting the entire contents of Wikipedia in order to extend the model's understanding of different languages. But if you take GPT-3, feed in millions of examples of phishing emails, and then just sort of tailor things around the format and structure of the company you're targeting, you've essentially got an automated spear phishing generator. In fact, one of the major challenges going forward is going to be distinguishing between uh, what was made by humans and what's AI generated. When machine learning continue to be, um, continuing to develop and improve, it's going to become harder and harder to tell the difference. <coughs> and for some things like generating little stories and poems and such, that might be a fun novelty. But when we're talking about phishing and that, there's a real serious growing threat here. But I will say, don't leave this talk thinking that AI can only be used as a kind of negative if you're working in cybersecurity. Like, just as it's being used here for you know harm and expo uh, exploitative purposes, there is just as many people and companies working to actually build AI-backed systems that detect, detect and thwart these kind of attacks. It's worth saying as well, I don't think AI is going to actually replace our uh, security teams. Rather, it's going to help sort of streamline and simplify um, a bunch of different tasks and processes across the whole field, um, both offensive and defensive. And none of the models I've actually mentioned here do anything radically new per se. Rather, um, with enough time and care, a human can just as easily write their own incredibly convincing phishing email, and many already do. Rather, it's this kind of um, advances in the AI that we've seen recently that really you know, um, disrupt and exploit, um, disrupt and um, lower the barrier to entry when you're trying to exploit that human aspect. AI completely supercharges this and gives the attacker basically an infinite number of attempts to deceive with basically zero effort. Like most things, AI is going to slowly work its way in our lives without us really noticing. If I say parts of stock were written by an AI, would you believe me? Would you have a way of telling the difference between what was generated by a human and what was made by an AI? And if you can, what makes you think your current defences can? Thank you. I will say um, two things before we go to questions. Um, I'll stress in the interest of not getting sued, that none of the companies I've mentioned in this talk condone using their models for the purposes. Um, please do not try and write malware or phishing emails for any of the models I've shown. Um, and if you're looking for some bonus content and such, um, you can find all the links and references and such at my site at this link. Yeah, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to. I have a question about uh, the artificial intelligence for video and voice generation. Mm -hmm. How good is the artificial intelligence, how good is the algorithms that recognize when a voice or video is artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and also, like, does that work for every type of person regardless of the language, race, location, is it more prevalent to the, like, Western world and English language rather than the, the rest of the world? Because you mentioned there was a, a Zelensky, yeah. Zelensky incident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, is there uh, is there any artificial intelligence so far that is undetectable by by humans? And you need a special type of detector. And my last uh, my last thing to the question is: Do you think in a few years there would be 
For example, when somebody rings your phone, there would be a built-in detector in Android that says potential <laughs> AI voice generated or something. Yeah, no, that's uh, fantastic, actually. Um, in terms of like, your comment about um, building models that aren't just sort of catering to like, the Western Hemisphere and that, that's a big issue kind of across the field and that. A lot of the data, things like Wikipedia and that, are primarily in English. So when you're trying to then build models that have an understanding of foreign languages or other cultures and that, there is quite a deficit of actual information that can be used for that, um, which is quite a big issue across the whole field. Um, but in terms of detection and such, it's challenging to say. Um, and some, it sort of depends on how vigilant people are and that, of how um, easy it is to sort of sneak past with a, a deep fake or other kind of synthetic um, media. Um, right now, the sort of approaches for using things like edge, de- edge detection and such is usually the best way for picking something like that up. Um, but as I said, you can, there is sort of a growing number of types of attack that you can do against models like these that will use things like sort of um, subpixel like noise and such, where to the person, to a human looking at it, that still looks like a regular normal image. But from the, if you're trying to detect that with an AI, it just looks like static. So it becomes quite challenging then of how you build systems that are, um, that work not just for humans trying to interact with media and such as they would do normally, but also in, in a way that AI can also look through that and pick up on if there's something not quite right. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, just to just to, to also mention that yeah, as as at this point are we are we yet at this point where you could receive a call from mm, someone yeah. and it can be like it can be AI not yeah. the person that claims and as I said, would there be a you think like in a year or two or five there would be like a, a security software on people's phones that would be able that are supposed to recognize that and give you an alert mm. if because if this becomes a problem they yeah. may decide to do it mm. yeah um, I, I would, if there isn't already something in place I would definitely think that that's in progress um, I'm sure many of you will get things like you know, fake delivery messages and such that are picked up right as it gets to your phone of this is probably a scam um, I would definitely see something like that happening where this doesn't sound right or it's um, either it's picking up based on the number that's calling you or sort of analyzing it at real time, I think would definitely be somewhere that's being explored as a way of I'm just problem. speaking about voice, no, not for mm. message, because there is spam like for yeah. text messages, mm. but I'm just speaking about analyzing the, the voice mm. that's coming yeah. in. So like the same kind of systems that would pick up on if, if a sort of regular text message is a scam, I think would also then get extended into analyzing if you're actually phoning someone or phoning someone new of the sense of the sense of synthetic or is something that's quite right. I think they would definitely definitely be worked on there okay thank you yeah, yeah. so um, chat GPT uh, one thing that makes it kind of awkward even for um, positive nice uses yeah is that if it if it so much as thinks you're doing something even a little bit suspicious it mm. clams up and refuses to talk to you yeah um, is uh is there evidence that, because you mentioned that people using mm. ChatGPT for automating communication with people on dating apps for scamming and stuff like that. Uh, is there evidence that people have found reliable ways to get around this to actually use it for this? So yeah. that, that's right, yeah. People were using it for um, not, not fun purposes. But what tended to happen was when it came out back in December, um, it was sort of released in what seemed like quite a neutral state of it. Yeah, it was more like that. Yeah, it would accept absolutely anything you yeah. put into it. And that, like a lot of the examples are given there, I don't actually think would run anymore if you asked it to do right. that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah so...